Alexander, real quick, this will probably be a quick video, but I have two questions to ask you mm. on uh, Russia. And it's, one of the questions was brought up during our live stream that has to do with the protests in uh, Khabarovsk, mm. which actually got fairly large. Yeah. Or, I think it was around 10,000 people were protesting in Khabarovsk, which is a city in the east, yes. uh, the far east of Russia. Yes. You'll get into that. I want you to explain Khabarovsk and if it's the situation there, if it's... Uh, if it is as it's being described in much of the Western mainstream mm. media, um, if the Putin government is uh, going undergoing some difficulties mm. in the Far East, but discussing Russia as well, the uh, mm. the uh, economic ministry, the finance ministry, mm. announced I believe they said that the economy is going to contract by four point two percent. That's pretty large. Oh, absolutely. Is is the Russian economy undergoing? Mm. Difficulties? Is this a problem for the Putin government? Absolutely. Well, first of all, it is going to contract this year. I mean, like uh, a government, like economies nearly everywhere, um, is going to experience a contraction because of the lockdowns that took place in March and April and May because of the CV crisis. You close down part of your economy for that length of time, it will lead to a contraction and Russia is going to experience a contraction. 4.2% relative to you know many countries is on the lower end of the scale. And the important thing to say is that apparently there's not been a big surge of unemployment. Inflation has been fairly subdued. So it is entirely up to now a vo uh, an, an output recession. In other words, production has fallen. Now, the IMF um, is predicting that the economy will recover fast next year. They're predicting an, uh, a 4.5 percent recovery uh, next year. So if that's true. Then they will recover all the all the all the ground they've lost this year. Next uh, and next year, I would add also. Uh, you know, and this is this is really very unusual for Russia, and it's the first time it's happened since the Soviet period, uh, the Soviet collapse. There's been no decline in their uh, uh, in their in their reserves, their foreign currency reserves, and there's been no great crisis in the ruble. The ruble has been remarkably steady overall, given the fact that there was this big oil price crash. I mean, it did fall back, but nothing like the kind of crisis that we've seen happen in other years, uh, in other, during other earlier crises. And um, the, actual, the actual reserves of hard currency held by the central bank have remained steady at about $570 billion. So they haven't had to support the ruble by taking out money from their reserves and spending it to support the ruble. And at the same time, because the ruble has been quite steady and inflation has been fairly subdued, the central bank has been able to cut interest rates and it's done so very aggressively. So they were about 7% going into this crisis. They've been cut down to 4% now. And that's the first time that's again happened in Russia since the end of the Soviet Union. I would call this the first modern Russian recession. Every other previous recession that we've had since in Russia since the end of the Soviet Union has been a recession of a transition of a transition economy still getting over the crisis that we have uh, that they experienced. Um, after the end, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the end of the Cold War and all this. This is the kind of recession that mature economies go through when they're hit by the same, the, the kind of crisis that CV represents. And they will get it all back. All right. How about Osk? Problematic? I think not very, actually. I mean, the thing to say about this, th all these protests, we've discussed this in an earlier video, are connected with the dismissal of, you know, Fergal, who was the governor who had won the election in that, uh, in, in, in the Far Eastern region. And in an earlier video, I explained some of the background to that, that Fergal is facing very severe very serious criminal charges. And there is a history in uh, uh, Khabarovsk and in the Far East of you know, various criminal activity and protests being brought out and things of this kind. This is not unusual in that part of Russia. But I would also add that you know, so far the protests have been confined to Khabarovsk. 
There are other big cities in the Far East, Vladivostok, Nahodka. Strangely enough, or perhaps not strangely, the protests have not spread to those places. There have been attempts to organize protests, and they haven't happened. And the other thing to say about these particular protests is that they seem to be very much focused on this one issue of Fergal. They do not seem to be directed at uh, you know, Putin personally. Um, when there was the constitutional referendum um, a few weeks ago, Khabarovsk voted heavily in support of those referendums. By The, the, the vote there was, I believe, 62%. And, you know, that's a solid vote for Putin. And apparently it was monitored by outside people. And it seems that it was accepted as being, you know, a, a fairly representative you know, fairly accurate reflection of sentiment there. So I do think this is a problem for Putin. I think what is a problem for Putin, what is a problem for the government in Russia, is not these protests, but the fact that the situation in the Far East still seems to be, has elements of very unruly uh, uh, and, you know, lawless behavior going back to the kind of Russia that existed in the 1990s. This has never really been sorted out. And given that it's far away from Moscow, it's quite clear that the authorities in Moscow still don't have the kind of control um, in places like Khabarovsk that they've achieved in other places closer to Moscow in Voronezh or Siberia or the Urals or wherever. And that, I think, is a concern. And I think that was one of the reasons why they acted so decisively over the Fergal affair. I mean, you know, they didn't they didn't wait to bring cases against him and all that. They just went ahead and arrested him. So I think that they do sense that the situation in Khabarovsk is not fully under control and hasn't ever been. And now they're trying to assert their control and they're running into some opposition, which is unsurprising. Yeah. I wonder how much of this has to do with the fact that Putin may end his uh, his presidency. This is his final term. Maybe. Maybe it's his final term. Yeah, so well, I'm sure. Part of the plan is to make sure that they also get the Far East under control. Absolutely. Finally. I mean, absolutely. Finally. And I mean, the other thing to what we say is that the Far East is an absolutely crucial re region. It's, it is resource wise, extremely rich. And um, there are also important military industries in that part of Russia. You know, people who know about Suhoi fighters, you know, the sort of Suhoi 35s and all the rest. They actually made in Khabarovsk. The factory that makes them is actually there. So it's, it's uh, strategically located. You know, it's close to Japan, China, Korea. Uh, um, you know, Putin has, you know, the Russians have great ambitions about building up this region economically. It's strategically important. And it's resource rich. So it's very important that they control this place, which is located so far away from Moscow. And I think that you're right. There is an urgency about this because there is political uncertainty in Moscow now. And there will continue to be, I think, for some time. All right. Alexander Merkers, thank you very much.